Well, uh, wow. I just had a wonderful conversation with my uh, my good friend and one of my heroes, Dr. Sophia Clements from Paleo Medicina in Hungary. And I wanted to make this a really deep dive into autoimmunity because of my own experience, experiences of people who come to me, experiences in my groups. And I really wanted to... Um, to see exactly what uh, what she would say about about a lot of these uh, these these common questions that we get we get asked uh, for, from uh, people who are struggling with this and there are a lot of things that are overcomplicated that need to be simplified and I asked Jofi a lot of questions and I particularly did a deep dive into dairy because there's so much. Um, so much misinformation about that. People are confused about it. People react to it. People think they don't react to it. So um, I, I hope you enjoy this. I, I, I wanted to make it pretty much a comprehensive discussion of the main areas that people ask about autoimmunity and leaky gut, gut permeability, and um, you know how long it takes to heal, what the process of healing is, what can scupper your, um, your your progress? And I got some fabulous answers. Uh, so, you know, I, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. I had a bunch more questions. I, I'm going to have to get get her back on again at some point. But um, so, uh, you know, if if you're, I, I would really recommend. I can't I've lost count of the amount of people I've referred to to Sophia. And if if you are very sick and you want to get things sorted out very quickly. I really would recommend a consult with her and, you know, particularly if you want to get blood work done and, and work with that kind of thing, um, you know, uh, absolutely cannot recommend paleo medicina highly enough. So there we go. Enjoy the podcast. And please, if you like the podcast, uh, consider donating. Um, there's a donate button below. Please, if you can make it a monthly donation, a recurring one, that would be even better. Um, help me keep it going i've got some great guests in mind that i'm going to get on um and please you know if if uh, you want a, a more general consult from me there's links below in my link tree and, and whatever and please check out what we're offering on the big fat challenge you know we have tribe calls all sorts of um um support about how to uh how to implement these these diets and and, and um, ancestral lifestyle and all that kind of thing and I have a lot of fun, a load of subjects covered, and all sorts of free courses, books, ninety hours of our uh, coaching calls early in the year, um, thirteen consecutive weeks of challenges, and even a sneak preview at the time that I record this of our, our red pill food revolution book, which is, uh, I think a bit of a masterpiece, to be honest, that Ben, Ben put the words together for. So, um, you know, the, um, the links are down below for that and check it out. We are offering that on a pay what you can afford basis. So, you know, I mean, even for the price of the book, when it comes out, you get all these thousands of other things. So anyway, join us on the big fat challenge, the big fat tribe, like and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube and um, consider donating to the podcast. And I shall see you on the next episode. Enjoy this one with, uh, with Sophia because it's great. Right, welcome back everybody to my Red Pill Buddhist podcast. And, and I'm so delighted today. I've got my good friend, Jofia Clements from Paleo Medicina in Hungary. And um, we, we had a, a lot of fun at my carnivore conference in 2019 where we met. And, and again, with just this conference in Sheffield. And it was so good to see, to see you again. And thank you so much for coming on and doing this. I've got- Thank you for inviting me. It's my oh. pleasure to be uh, chatting with you again. Cool. I just want to pick your brain so much. I've got a million questions, but I'll try and only ask about 500,000. 
<laughs> so I wanted to really get do a deep dive on autoimmunity today, but I mean, probably I should think people who are watching this know who you are. You're a bit of a celeb, you know, mm. you're a hero of mine. And so I know, I know it all, but just really briefly, what what are you doing? What is the work that you're doing at Paleo Medicina? Is it even called Paleo Medicina anymore? It's like ICNMI or something like this? Yes, we, we use both names, ICMNI, uh, which is the, the new name, but we also use the Paleo Medicina, which is the old name. So the combination of the both. Yeah, we, we, are, we are doing, we are dealing with patients in the first place. And uh, we also build uh, a research on uh, the um, the ongoing patient work, so we we deal with uh, with, with with very different uh, diseases, uh, from diabetes to as you said autoimmune diseases uh, and cancer and even neurological uh, disorders, and uh, we, are, we are providing medical care and um, dietary guidance. Uh, and, and this is what we are doing for, have been doing for the last now 11, 10 years. So, so there is quite a past uh, behind us and uh, there is quite an experience um, uh, with these conditions. So um, we, 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 are, we are building, we, we, are, we, are, we are on our own. Uh, so this is quite separate uh, from from the mainstream or uh, from the official healthcare system. This is how it uh, should be done because, as you already know, there is not much uh, communication or uh, a possibility for communication between the two two sides. Or we can even. Uh, mention a third side, which is uh, the alternative medicine side, which which are also separate from. Because I mean, what we are doing is completely uh, based on science and, and not outside of science. Yeah, and, and, and it's proper science, not the scientism that goes on in the medical industry today. I mean, it, I, it, it honestly blows me away what you guys are doing there. And I can I can say, from my own experience, because you know my history and and um, sort of going through sort of uh, well psoriatic arthritis and being in agony about ten years ago, and then messing up at the end of last year as well, which you helped me with so much. Thank you so much, and got me out of it very quickly. Um, but I know that that the thing that you're doing there, you know, with the PKD, with the Paleolithic ketogenic diet. I can say from my own experience that I 100% agree with you. I mean, the difference between when you go carnivore and slightly mess it up and when you go fully PKD is night and day when you have autoimmunity. It's very difficult to get that across to people. But today, I, I want to ask you some questions. And with that in mind, that I absolutely agree with you. You know, I want to play sort of devil's advocate here and ask a few questions particularly with a, a bit of a deep dive into dairy at some point, because, you know, when, when we were in Sheffield a little while ago, Ben Hunt, my friend who I run the big ch fat challenge with and the, wrote the red pill books and whatever. And we, we took, we took Sophia out for a little bit of a walk around the peak districts and whatever, and hung out at the conference. And I asked some silly questions and put it up on Facebook, uh, YouTube on my YouTube channel, but the comments about dairy really, really hit, people you know they they have this sort of sacred cow idea that dairy is wonderful especially if it's raw and all that and it triggered some amazing reactions it really made me laugh but i'm going to come to that in a bit i mean what i'd love to ask you first is there are a lot of theories about autoimmunity and exactly what causes it you know there's the silly one in the in the mainstream of oh it's genetic and it's your body attacking itself now i i don't believe that for a moment um, but there are also things, you know, you work very much with gut integrity. And is it, is this theory of molecular mimicry right? That the body gets confused and attacks similar molecules as to the proteins that are getting through into the blood? Or do you think it's something like there are certain toxins in certain parts of the body that the body is trying to clear? What actually causes autoimmunity mm -hmm. in, in your opinion? Yeah, this is a very good question because I believe that none of those things um so the, the key behind uh, developing an autoimmune disease is indeed the intestinal permeability which is also called uh, the leaky gut 
which means that we have uh, when we have a proper intestine, uh, this is subserving two functions. One is absorption, and the second one is uh, subserving um, the barrier function. And you need both because you need to absorb what you need, uh, and you also have to uh, you have to also also have to uh, get rid of what you do not need. So, uh, and, and the combination of the two is resulting in uh, something that is called selective permeability. And this function requires the integrity of the intestine, the intestinal membranes. And whenever you eat something, uh, basically anything in theory, uh, which is outside meat, fat, animal fat and organ meats, that can mess up the intestinal barrier. And uh, as a result, uh, you may be developing an autoimmune, autoimmune reaction or an autoimmune disease itself. And when I'm saying outside meat, fat, and organs, this literally means milk and dairy too. Actually, there are two major enemies uh, of the intestinal barrier. And one is cereal, and the second one is milk or anything that is coming from milk. It is basically because of the milk protein that causes, or the combination of the two, or in combination with a third factor. Um, and you can easily get these three combined if you are eating a Western type diet. Uh, but once you have developed an autoimmune disease at some point in your life, uh, you will be you will remain sensitive uh, basically to to anything so you do not need these uh, food components in combination it is perfectly enough uh, if you if you eat milk or any dairy on the top of eating red meat for example and this messes up a lot of people because they they may think that milk and dairy is also coming from uh, the same animal from where the, the red meat is coming from. So it should be okay. Uh, but, uh, but, but actually the, 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 the clinical evidence shows that it makes a huge difference whether you are eating milk and dairy or <clears throat> you, you are eating the diet which is, uh, which is not containing milk and dairy. And of course, then you, can, you can find the, the literature behind uh, where you can base uh, what you are saying, what you're talking about. But, but, the, but the number one point is always the, the clinical evidence. And there are certain diseases which are very sensitive to milk and dairy, the milk protein itself, like uh, the, the, the psoriasis uh, that, that you mentioned before. before. Uh, I, can, I can tell you a few other ones like type one diabetes, development of type one diabetes, or Crohn's disease. There are a few other more, uh, but, but these are the, the ones that are very, very, very sensitive. And so far you are not removing the milk component from a carnivore diet. It is very likely that you will not recover. Yeah, and, and the theory behind, because you asked uh, about the theory. Yeah. So, yeah. so the first thing uh, is that, um, uh, you may develop the intestinal permeability itself, which means that certain macromolecules from your intestine can get across this intestine, can get into your blood, maybe circulating in your body uh, with a circulation. And, uh, and, and these proteins, which are not completely digested, like the ones coming from the milk or only fragmented but not properly digested and broken down into amino acids. So these longer chain molecules uh, may, be, um, may be forming a complex with certain molecules in your own body. And, and this complex is eliciting an immune response from your immune system. And, and this is the point where your immune system starts uh, destructing this complex because this is the way how your body is trying to get rid of something that is recognized as a danger signal to the immune system. Basically, this theory is coming from uh, Professor Loren Cordain. He was the one who 
who, who developed this, this theory. I think he didn't have clinical data to support this, but, but, he, but we do see this being reflected in the clinical practice. Yeah, this is it, it's fascinating. I mean, to, to go more into the dairy thing, because, you know, there is there is a um, people always come up, come in, uh, pop up on my channel and whatever. And they say, well, you know, we've seen loads of people heal via Gerson therapy and veganism and that kind of thing. <laughs> you know, and some people, I think, because it's a fast and they're swapping one set of plant toxins for another, they might have some initial results. But in my in my experience, people who do it that way, they end up in more trouble down the line with the recurrence of the initial issue, mm. um, but also with, um, uh, you know, problems from the plant toxins that they're taking in while they're doing all their juice spinach, which, you know, I, I, I definitely got into trouble with. But would you say some people also pop up and they say, yes, but what about all the wonderful cures on on raw milk, you know? People have just taken nothing but raw milk for months and they've cured this and that, you know, and their leg fell off and they grew it back again. And, you know, all of this sort of stuff. I mean, what what's your opinion on people who say that about raw dairy? Because I was fascinated when you said to us in, in the Peak District that you think that actually raw dairy can be worse than the pasteurized dairy. And in a way, you see, that makes sense to me. Somebody it was funny, actually. Somebody on my YouTube channel came up and said, Oh, has any, anybody ever told you, Phil, that you're so easily led? And I said, listen, I've got an open mind. This makes sense to me. Do you think that because I didn't punch Sophia in the face that I actually think that, you know, <laughs> that, that I'm easily led? It's ridiculous. People get so passionate about this business. So anyway, I'm waffling. But my question is, you know, because I'm open to this, I would say that it, it makes sense to me if the milk proteins and the, and the, and the, the growth factors and whatever in milk are the issue they would be more intact in raw milk but yeah. how is it that people seem to be getting um uh relief so so the anecdotes go um on, on raw milk diets and stuff you know mm -hmm. so uh, it, it is also depending on a time frame you know because this is a time frame where when you interact with these people but if you as is the same set of people in a year, in two years, they may have uh, another opinion. Uh, so everything is relative, you know. Uh, if you are coming from a Western diet and uh, change your diet as a whole, except dairy, for example, then you may um, you may feel a tremendous benefit, weight loss. Um, Oh, you know what else <laughs> uh, but as time goes on it can be that you start uh, regaining uh, your weight or it can be that your uh, blood pressure will uh, start uh, creeping up uh, and, and there are many negative examples that, that I've already seen because these patients are coming to us and we see these uh, these negative consequences in in a in a more concentrated way. People come to us who are already over many 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 uh, very different diets, including ones that uh, include dairy, including ones that are exclude dairy. But but sooner or later they they realize that uh, even if it may seem that they were able to get rid of one problem, they may gain another problem, uh, not removing the milk or any dairy. And let me give you one very, very, very specific example. And this will be very important for your, your male listeners, because there are a lot of people in the carnivore or low carb society who start eating a low carb diet that is based, which is a general ketogenic diet or a general carnivore diet, and it still includes milk, dairy, butter, whatever, ghee, even ghee, for weight loss, for building muscles, uh, for, for health aims, long-term health aims, longevity, whatever. They, they may have very different uh, goals uh, in their heads. And, and we very often see that these patients develop an increase in a PSA, prostate enlargement or even prostate cancer 
which is a set of diseases which is very, very, very closely related uh, to the milk protein, which is to be found in any milk or any dairy. And, and they do not understand what, what's going on because initially uh, they enjoy the benefits of eating a, a low carb diet. They, they do not want to go uh, farther than eating a general low carb diet or more strict because that work seemed to be working for them for some time. But there was a, at some point where they started developing these symptoms and then they are completely lost because they see the benefits and then they see this, this new result and, and they, they, these two, two things doesn't add up for them. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing because well, um, the first four years or so when I went carnivore from 2015, I um, I, I was um, eating mostly, well, just pretty much meat and butter. And everything did really, really reverse absolutely beautifully. But then I, I, I noticed it was actually around the time when Detta was, was diagnosed with Graves and you were talking about it. And she said, well, yeah, I can give up the plants, but oh, do I have to give up dairy? And I went, do you know what? I'll get rid of the butter as well. And it was amazing, the difference. I didn't have any problems with the joints at the time, but suddenly sort of abs came out again. I had my, my sinus issues cleared up that I had over the winter that I thought were to do with, um, you know, central heating or something. And I, I, I lost a bunch of fat. And that was probably around the time I met you at the carnival conference. But it was quite astonishing what it does. And I've seen it in, 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 in people who come to me as well, you know, and people who we have on our challenge. And I just sort of, sort of ease them through it. And then they have some problems left. And then you just say, listen, just try dropping the dairy. Go on, give it a go. And it's amazing. Even if people without autoimmunity, like people who have weight stalls and whatever, and they're just taking in a little bit of dairy, suddenly they get rid of the dairy. And and it seems to redo all the hormonal balance or something, in, particularly in women. You know, they seem to get over weight stalls when they even stop sure. the last bit of dairy. Yes, because uh, this uh, the milk is containing these uh, hormone-like factors, which are insulinogenic. So even if the milk and the dairy is containing only low amounts of carbohydrate, it is uh, causing um, uh, weight gain because these proteins have an um, effect which is very similar to insulin, like the insulin-like um, growth factor, which is a growth factor. So it induces weight gain uh, because of this. So it is not just protein, but it is a protein with a biological effect which you do not need yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you are not an infant anymore. You are an adult and, and you do not need any more insulinogenic effect uh, in your life. That's why you are cutting out carbohydrates and that's why you need to cut out any milk or dairy. Yeah. Now what... it, may be, it may be working for some people, I have to tell you, that some people can tolerate, can fall for some time, but, but it is not a guarantee that it will remain so in the next 10 years that's interesting because a lot of people say no i'm absolutely fine with dairy and at some points i have been as far as my joints yeah. go but then listening to it from your point of view then this sort of thing is building up and it's a bit of russian roulette for the future right exactly yes yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. The autoimmunity is is building up um over the years or decades before you are being diagnosed with a certain disease yeah, exactly. It has, it has been there. It has been there before years. And that, that brings me to another question, because one of the main things, I think, because people think that a, a, a meat only diet is so insane and so dangerous and whatever, they find it very difficult to get the confidence from the start. And so they'll sort of get go like a week or two and then it's kind of a bit better, but then they'll get a flare and then they'll get this or that. It was interesting with me because the first time I... I got really sick, like 2010. It took me about three years to sort it out. And this time, last November, December, it probably took like three months, you know, to be back on my feet and fine because I had the confidence and I didn't, because it didn't, it didn't stop in a week. I thought it would because usually I can fast and I will come onto that because I know you don't like that much. But usually like, you know, if I do eat something a bit wrong, I just don't eat for a day and it's gone. If I get a twinge in some joint or something like that, but this time it didn't go. It was really there to stay. But because I had confidence with it, complete mm -hmm. confidence, what I've seen with other people, I just went for it and thought, well, there's nothing else I can do apart from all my woo-woo stuff, you know. 
that I was doing and all the light and magnetism and, you know, getting your sleep right and all that kind of thing and sunlight. But there was, um, you know, a complete confidence in what was going on. And it turned around very quickly um, for that. But if you have, you, you know, when you have patients and sometimes, you know, sometimes it's amazing. Sometimes I see people go, oh, I, I was just diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis. I went completely carnivore. It's all gone in two weeks. And I have to say to people, well, be cautious of that. Well done to that person. But be cautious because, you know, as you say, it's been building up for decades. Can we fix it in two or three days? Probably not. How do, why is it that people still get uh, little flares and reactions when they do just eat, say, fatty beef and lamb? Um, is that to do with the protein still getting through a bit until the gut has healed, and particularly if they're not eating high enough fat? But also, how do you help them to have that kind of confidence and, and to get through it when they have flares? That will, oh, I've had a bit of a flare this week, but now I'm OK that week. Oh, I've had another one. And, that's sometimes how it happens, right? And then it tails off and tails off. How do you give them confidence and keep them mm. on the path? So, so the first question um, is regards why does this happen? Um, so the intestinal permeability, uh, in order to fix the intestinal permeability, you may need uh, three weeks. If you are very healthy, you are very young, uh, you can fix, you can normalize intestinal permeability in, in three years. If you're not that young, uh, if you are taking medicines, if you're taking supplements, if anything in your diet is not as perfect as it can be or should be, it can take longer than three weeks. And any minor event uh, or any minor additive in your food uh, may be ruining of what you have been doing for weeks before. Okay, can I can I just interrupt there? Because you said three weeks, then three years, then three weeks. Did was that all supposed to be three weeks there that you can fix it in three weeks if you're young and healthy? So this this is this is what we have uh, previously seen with our intestinal permeability measurements, uh, which is called the PEC four hundred test. This is a test which is designed to measure intestinal permeability uh, itself, and 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 we have uh, tested this uh, condition with this test uh, at various intervals and and this is what we have uh, uh, what we have seen um, on a consistent basis that the three weeks is, is a turning point you can expect that the intestinal permeability which has been elevated initially and which is always elevated goes back to being normal in in about three weeks in children, it can happen more quickly. In elderly, it can take a longer time or with Crohn's disease or diseases that are specifically affecting uh, the intestine, it can take longer than three weeks. But if we just take an average patient, um, it can take, we can, we, can, we can say that on average, this is expected to last at least three weeks. And then you can start seeing the benefits maybe earlier already um, and um, the, the other thing that the autoimmune process that is going on uh, also needs time to attenuate so so that's why we have this delay uh, in the effect but whatever you whatever treatment you use you should be expecting a delay <laughs> because there has been a delay too before your condition developed uh, because of something that happened to your life so it comes with a delay and and uh, if it is three weeks uh, then then you have to be patient for three weeks and and wait out uh, the effects and yeah of course this is a leap leap of faith patients very often come to us who already do their research or, or read, read a lot of articles or in a Facebook group or have seen somebody else going through the same process and and and, and most of them already know what what they are into when when they start uh, our program and and what when, what can can we tell them in between is that uh, we are asking for a f uh, feedback on a daily basis uh, we have an online uh, patient tracking system and, and we track everything that is measurable at home, including their symptoms. 
And um, with doing this, they have an immediate feedback. Uh, they can they can see uh, how they their symptoms change or at least tend to change before everything get fixed. So they already start seeing the the tendencies with their symptoms. So if they start with a symptom level of nine and in in five days they only have a symptom level of seven, then then they may think that okay I will go on because at least it didn't get worse it get a little bit better so so this is let's see what would be happening in the next few days or or two weeks the two weeks is a good window because this is a window where things uh, really change significantly and most of the patients not of course not get cured entirely but but there is only already a definite change for the positive and the two weeks is to, to teach uh, patients how to effectuate the diet properly, how they can rely on their own measurements. So the two weeks is for, for learning, uh, going through the learning curve, and then they can do it on their own uh, without external help. External help on a daily, daily basis, of course, because otherwise they can help, uh, they can get help. And the other things we do is that we... Uh, suggest regular uh, blood works to track certain parameters, including inflammation markers, inflammation levels. And we do different inflammation markers. And the combination of these markers is a very good uh, feedback as regards how the inflammation overall changes through time. So even if a patient may not feel or may only feel a small improvement. If there is a big improvement or, or a measurable difference between two inflammation marker levels, that, that already tells something because this is very, very objective coming from the laboratory. So, so they, they can go with, your, with their own measurements uh, in addition to what they feel subjectively. Oh, and, and there are so many little things that people get in their heads that, that slow down progress. I mean, I've heard you say, and um, no supplements. And so many people get obsessed with supplements. And, and I would say that, you know, it, it, apart from keeping the gut leaky, because they have some horrible fillers in them and all that sort of thing. I mean, it's very easy to explain, I think, to people that, that if their gut's really leaky, they're probably not going to be absorbing any of those things anyway. And they're much better to be got from food in the first place. But the people who think that they need supplements are probably the people who can absorb them the least and they're not very absorbable anyway. But is there is there a case at any time? It's like some people say they go carnivore or, or you know, and they sort out their, uh, their, their main issue. And then down the line, they still have something sort of niggling here and there. And there's a lot of things floating about about you know, then some you might need uh, um, some some decent supplements at that point to correct an issue that carnivore hasn't been able to correct. And we're talking mostly about carnivore here, not PKD. But, you know, some people then they'll get, you know, there's a big craze in, in, the, in the carnivore world at the moment on thiamine. And, you know, oh, we've got a thiamine deficiency and this and that. And we need to take a load of thiamine to boost that. I've up. heard about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I would guess that the natural way is to eat fatty meat and then your vitamin pill is liver and other organs and whatever. And, and that will in time correct things. Do you think there's ever a case for somebody to, to sort of boost up something via a supplement as let's say the six month point where they think, oh, well, okay, I've got a bit of dry skin or I've got this kind of thing, but I've got rid of my main issue. Or are supplements, do you think they are always totally unnecessary? I mean, I know now and again, you say to take some of that Vigantol, the vitamin D, to a very short period of time to boost that up. But is mm -hmm. there anything else that's worth looking at? Like six months down the line, do you ever say to somebody, oh, you might need a bit of thiamine now or something? Do you do that? <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. Um, so I, I really do think that outside vitamin D, um, you do not need uh, any other vitamins specifically not in a pill or no minerals because we can also uh, mention magnesium which i believe is the number one 
mineral supplement and uh, a lot of people are suffering from leg cramps or low mood and think they can help this uh, by taking magnesium. Uh, but uh, the, so there are two things. If you have a symptom that uh, because of that you need a supplement, then, then there may be an issue with your diet. There may be a problem with your diet and inadequacy with your diet. And then you, you should look for what it is, find out what it is. Um, asking for professional's help or looking at the blood work. Uh, and, and you should use this as an information, as a feedback uh, that something is not okay. So you should perfect your diet and, and see uh, whether these um, whether these symptoms goes away or not. So I think it is better not to cover any symptoms because they are signaling, always signaling something to you. And um, sometimes it is easy to cover a leg cramp and you will not have leg cramp anymore, but there still may be something wrong with the diet, which will have an impact on your health or your disease uh, trajectory later on. Um, yeah, so 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 th this is the main thing about uh, the, the supplement. The other one is that supplements do not most often do not contain um, the, the minerals or the vitamins in the form that is otherwise bioavailable to your body. These vitamins very often come from plant sources, for example, like vitamin A. A lot of people speak about, and this is also a, a huge topic, vitamin A toxicity. And uh, what should we do about eating the liver on a carnivore diet, whether it is causing vitamin A toxicity or not? You, and, you, you read my mind. That was my next question. <laughs> yeah, because everybody else is speaking about and asking me about vitamin A toxicity, which is a non-existing issue if you are eating a PKD or even a carnivore diet or only liver diet. <laughs> there are some people who are doing this, which is not good by the way. But even if you eat liver the whole day, you will not uh, get vitamin A toxicity because vitamin A in the form that is coming from the liver is very different from the form that is coming from the supplements or uh, plant-derived vitamin A, which can cause vitamin A toxicity, definitely. Uh, but it is not the same form as it is coming from the from the meat or the organ meats, because we have vitamin A and we have retinol. And these molecules are very similar, but one is bioavailable and the other one is, 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 is not a good match to your body, to your uh, enz enzymatic pathways that deal with this vitamin. Uh, and I do not know any vitamin A supplement that is coming from liver. Of course, we get these uh, dried liver supplements, uh, which, which is another huge topic. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, the same thing with the magnesium. You can, you can have very different magnesium, but all of them are causing side effects. And in the end, may, may not even increase your magnesium level or even if increase your magnesium level, that there should be something wrong with it in the end, it may turn out. Instead, you should be correcting your diet, make sure that everything is done properly. Uh, and by the way, if you do pro, uh, PKD, then that's the correct way of eating meat, fat and organs. And then you will not have any magnesium deficiency. A few years ago, we have published a study, which was a group study, uh, and we looked at the magnesium levels uh, of patients uh, being on PKD. And it turned out that basically everybody had uh, his or her magnesium level in the, in the proper range. So there was no uh, magnesium deficiency, which is very often associated with the symptoms that these patients had otherwise. So these were autoimmune patients, Crohn's disease patients, cancer patients, diabetes. There were also a few healthy controls. But in the end, regardless of the original disease, in the end, nobody had any magnesium deficiency if properly followed the PKD. 
So instead of supplementing magnesium, you should make sure that you properly follow the PKD. It, 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 it is just as simple as that. It's, it, basically, it's just nature knows best, right? Yes. <laughs> you, you cannot oversmart nature because nature had a few millions of years <laughs> as an advantage. Exactly, yeah. Oh, but, yeah. I mean, would you say that if somebody, once they've regained their health and their gut integrity, do they still need organ meats? Because they're most of the sort of lo really long-term carnivores, but most of those actually didn't have an autoimmune condition or whatever to get out of. It's like we were chatting and, and he said, you, you were saying at the conference that it depends on somebody's goals. You know, if they're eating sort of five pounds of ribeye steak a day and, and they're a big dude and a bodybuilder and whatever, then that's a different goal to somebody who's trying to fix an autoimmune condition. But in, in the case of those people who have very good gut integrity, their body's fine, whether they've healed or whether they've always had it like that, do people still need to eat organ meats, do you think? Or is it just a, 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 yes, a I, I do our think vitamin so. pill while we're healing? Yes, I, I think everybody uh, need uh, organs, um, basically for vitamin D. There are other vitamins too, but uh, vitamin D is, uh, is, is the major vitamin you need uh, from the liver. And uh, if you are coming from a place um, of a disease or any elevated uh, inflammation level for whatever cause, you need more vitamin because the inflammation or any high blood sugar will use more vitamin D out of your pool that you have in your body. So you have to replace that vitamin by eating organ meats uh, on a regular basis. Uh, if you are somebody relatively healthy, you, you will also need vitamin D uh, because uh, you need it for only the food. You cannot get it from the sun for most of the year, right? <laughs> uh, not even in Africa. I also do have a few patients from Africa or patients uh, or, or countries, which is very sunny uh, the whole year, and they still come to us with very low vitamin D levels, as surprise, uh, surprising it may sound. So this is the case. Uh, if you are somebody who is relatively healthy, it can be that you need uh, less vitamin D or less organ meat, and, and you may be doing well with less. But if you are somebody drinking coffee or drinking tea or doing small allowances or doing more sports than an average person, or you just got a, 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 an upper respiratory infection, you again need more vitamin D than otherwise. And, and this is what you see from the measurements. If patients stop eating liver or run out of liver, um, their vitamin D can drop in, in two weeks or even 10 days below what is healthy. And with a low vitamin D level, you, you will not recover properly. And then you are again in this vicious circle that, oh, I am doing the diet for a long time, and I'm not recovering, or I, I have, um, I, I've fallen back, or I am, I, 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 I'm still struggling with fatigue, or whatever, even if my skin healed, or whatever, so I have mixed, I have mixed results, and you can have mixed results so far your vitamin D is low, well, here's a weird one. Here's a puzzle for you, actually, that I've always meant to ask you, and I've 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 always forgotten. Um, if I did ask you before, never mind, because I'm asking it in public now. But it was about 2010, and you know, I I I love Jack Cruz. He did the foreword to my my book, and and he's you know he's all about light. It doesn't matter what you eat as long as you're in the sun all the time, you know, and all of that. And this is his thing. But I I was starting to look at at his his work, and I realized that whether he's spot on or not about all that stuff i had been living a very dodgy lifestyle i was a really big fat bastard i wore contact lenses for 30 years so apparently you don't get all the natural light in your eyes and i hated the sun i got to the point where I, you know when i was a kid i used to have beautiful melanin i'd go the color of my kids now you know 
Uh, and and it was fantastic. But then uh, as the sort of inflammation came up, my skin changed and I ended up sort of going bright red in the sun and really itching. And, and I hated it. I hated the heat. I hated the sun. And then it came to a point where I got really sick and then I went vegan, you know, lost all the muscle, all the weight. I lost about 90 pounds and still didn't fix my joints, obviously, except it gave me kidney stones, which we'll come to later. I want to talk to you about that, too, obviously. But um I, I thought, right, OK, I've got to get my vitamin D checked. I haven't been in the sun for like 15 years because my body hates it so much. And, and I hadn't supplemented. I hadn't done anything. And I went down and got my vitamin D checked. And it was 183. And I thought, how is this possible? Is this is this does it sometimes happen that any vitamin D you have in your body will be not going to any sort of use at all, but be circulating because you're your metabolism and, and, and physiology is so messed up. I mean, do you think they got my test messed up with somebody else? Or is it possible to just have a, a, a reading of 183 that's complete anomaly? What happened there? Well, uh, the, uh, I, I need the units for this number because there are different unit systems. I guess right. this is one or more per liter. Yeah, well, OK, well, it basically, it, it, if this tool can translate, because I, I can't translate that, but I can say that what they put is, is in that uh, system of, me of measurement, they say that 180 is dangerously high. That's the limit mm. that they say they're scared about. How come I was over that without supplementing or being in the sun for 15 years? <laughs> what happened there? No, the, the first thing, it, it is not dangerously high because there is uh, basically no dangerously high vitamin D level. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I know, yeah. It's, uh, upwards, <laughs> it, it, it is almost endless. Um, I have also seen a few cases um, who had such a high vitamin D level, and, and this is very often coming from a previous high dose uh, vitamin D supplementation. Uh, for example, there are these uh, extremely high vitamin D uh, therapies for multiple sclerosis that you have to take uh, 100,000. Uh, units a day across two months, uh, which is which is artificially high, uh, without a major effect on your health or the MS. But whatever, there are a lot of people who who try such uh, protocols with uh, these mega doses of vitamin D, and even if uh, they stop taking vitamin D for a year. If you check your vitamin D uh, after a year, it can be still very high because your body still has not used it up entirely. It could, it, it could, it could well have been that. It could well have been that. It may be a year before or something like that. I had some craze on it and swallowed it. That's interesting. It can last that long. As I remember one time when you you explained to Detta how to take that Vigantol stuff, and she didn't. She she misinterpreted what you said and took, you know, whole bottles and whatever in a day and then went down for a test. And it was like, you know, a regular blood test. But the vitamin D came up as 250 and they freaked out and phoned her up. You've got to get down here straight away. We were laughing. It was like, yes, it'll be fine. There's no problem. But they freak yes. out. You know, you've yes. got to you got to keep those yes, doctors on a yes, tight that, That's not, not a problem. But what I'm trying to explain uh, to patients that there are no additional benefit. Uh, beyond the normal range of your vitamin D, because there are such uh, opinions too that you have to have a very, very, very high. The higher, the better. But but we do not see any such uh, association with with a disease course or inflammation level or whatever. Anything that is way beyond uh, the the normal range is uh, not associated with any any such benefit. Uh, it, but it is also not harmful. It will not do anything to you. You, ju you just can be sure that you will have a very good vitamin D level for the next six months of your life and you can sleep very well <laughs> because of this. But otherwise, no, no, no further benefit. And also, it naturally, if, if, I, if I do see such a high vitamin D level in the blood work, I know that it is coming from supplements, uh, either currently or from past supplements and it is not a natural it is not a, a level that you can achieve in a natural way you yeah. cannot achieve such levels uh, through the sun or through eating liver because again it is a supplement and the liver is a liver 
There are enzymes that are breaking down the excess vitamin D, uh, and, and, and you cannot achieve uh, a vitamin D level higher than, let's say, 100 nanomole per liter in a normal, in a natural way from the food. So that, that is another argument why you should be going with your natural foods, because then it will be regulated in a proper way. You cannot overdose vitamin D, but if you go with a supplement, you can easily overdose. And there will not be any problem with the vitamin D because it is a vitamin that you cannot uh, basically over, overdose, but you can overdose vitamin A or you can overdose other vitamins um, that cause symptoms or prevent uh, your recovery. Oh, yeah. It's just, you know, doing everything naturally and the body sorts itself out in time. It's like weird yeah. things happen in yeah. the meantime. You just have to think less and yeah, things yeah. will be much simpler than otherwise. It's like people, you know, freak out about the cholesterol thing. But I mean, everybody understands that. So we won't get into that now. But I mean, so many people, when they when they go on to a, a, a proper diet, and then they freak out when the LDL goes up and all that. And that's, you know, in that carnival group, somebody's always asking that. I don't even bother answering it anymore because I know there's going to be a hundred people underneath who are going to say, "Don't worry about it." But no, listen. I don't. Don't answer either. Um, and, and my reasoning is that uh, cholesterol is a blood parameter that should be never uh, assessed in itself. Yeah. So sometimes I got emails, I got questions of whether I will die with a cholesterol level of 12 or <laughs> is it healthy, whether I get a heart attack. I cannot tell because I do not depends know anything. What else, depends what else you're doing and what else. Then, you yeah, what else you are doing and depend on what else your body parameters are showing. Sure. So forget about um, looking at cholesterol as a single parameter because it can reflect actually uh, a lot of things, which is not associated with heart disease in the first place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, well, I wanted to ask you about eggs because this is something that comes up a lot with people with autoimmunity. And I find, you know, even as a kid, I hated egg whites. I, I just didn't like them. And I remember being forced to eat them once at school and I actually threw up in the teacher's lap when he was sitting next to me at dinner. And I, I, I warned him. So don't make me eat those things. I mean, they were okay in scrambled eggs, omelets or whatever. I eat that. But nowadays I don't really, I don't eat the, the whites and I haven't eaten them. I, I was reacting to them in the winter. I couldn't eat them. But now, I mean, for example, over the past week, like I'm feeling fine and whatever, but over the past week, I've really started to uh, crave them. Something in me is telling me that I need them. And so I've been having them, but usually I would have them sort of on a burger with a load of butter and then some egg yolks. I don't have the butter now. I just put I just put that on with some extra tallow or whatever. How how do you find that people eat uh, uh, react to eggs when they're very when they've got a, a very leaky gut and they're in a flare? Uh, are the whites worse than the yolks, as people say? And are eggs kind of okay? Is it sometimes people even seem to react to the yolks, but then yeah. they're okay? But this is not a food that you would put in the category of dairy that will harm you, but maybe you can be sensitive to in the short term. Am I right on that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it, it is depending on um, where are we coming from, uh, whether your intestinal permeability has normalized already. So where you are in the process, for how long time, are you properly following the diet? Is everything okay with your diet? So um so 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 the goal is what we do uh, most of the time with patients that have a serious disease so we cannot risk we cannot play around uh, we put them on the most strict version of the pkd which is literally meat fat and organ meats and that's it no eggs and and and, and we look at the blood parameters we look at how symptoms change and if we see that uh, they reached their baseline uh, in terms of not having the disease associated symptoms. So for example, somebody with Crohn's disease have no more bloody stool or no more abdominal cramps, no fever, nothing for some time and have a blood work that is that looks as expected at this time on the PKD, 
then we may say that uh, you can give it a try. If you are craving for eggs, you can you can you can try it, but it is just a try. <laughs> Eat it and 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 look at the reactions because this is something that we cannot predict. This is something that you need to find out because it's very 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 individual. Because if you are carrying a sensitivity to eggs uh, from your past, then it can be that you will be always reacting to eggs, and it can also be that it will go away and and you can eat eggs. But this is something that you have to find out yourself. Uh, looking at the feedbacks, uh, but eggs is 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 not a major is is not um, the is not at the core of the diet itself. Eggs typically comes uh, in in a, in a next phase. Of course, who are relatively healthy and only want to lose weight, they may be doing with with eating eggs from the very beginning. We we used to ask a, a few very specific questions, which also. Uh, includes a few questions about um, uh, vaccination history, not just the COVID, but other vaccines. And because the more vaccines you got in the past or in the in the near past, uh, the more likely that you will react to eating eggs, uh, whether it is egg white or egg yolk, both. You may be reacting to both. So egg is not a safe category of food for for everyone yeah that's Myself, uh, i cannot eat eggs i I'm, I'm on pkd for 10 years and i'm still not able to eat eggs but this really? is my, my my specific sensitivity and, and i'm not sensitive to anything as to this extent interesting one one of the members in our big fat challenge asked me to ask you after hearing the um um thing about milk you know and the, and the growth the, the growth factors in it and whatever would that would that actually apply to eggs in any way because that's only supposed to be for a young chick right i mean obviously we did raid nests and we ate them but would there be any correlation with that that it's only supposed to be for babies uh the, the eggs yeah same as the dairy no i think eggs is supposed to be to starving animals <laughs> where, where nothing else is available uh, for carnivorous animals Th this is my thinking so eggs eggs is never if, if you look at the diet of different carnivore animals I, I think eggs is a is not a number one food item carnivore animals run after and take down other animals and if they are running out of um, animal meat then that's a point where they start uh, robbing the nests of the birds, I, I think. And it is also not complete uh, when it comes to nutrients, um, the whole spectrum of the nutrients. There are a few items that are missing from the eggs, despite the notion that egg, egg is regarded to be very nutritious. It is ju just a matter of what you compare it to. If you compare it to the Western type diet, or if you compare it to bread, which is containing almost no nutrients, then eggs, of course, is, is, is a nutritious food. But if you compare it to meat, fat, and organ meats in combination, then eggs is less than a full value food item. For example, it, it, it is lacking vitamin C. Yeah, that's... Uh... Kind of, and it is also lacking iron. So, and yeah. without iron, you cannot um, uh, you, you you cannot um, live a healthy life for a long time. Sure. Right. Come on, then. Let's dive in. Oxalates. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I mean, it, it must have some sort of a, a a bearing on certain things because. You know, you get the calcium oxalate stones and kidney stones and whatever. Um, and I, I would think that because I'd never had kidney stones all my life and I only got them after I did months of juicing spinach and turmeric and almonds and all that sort of crap. Uh, and then I got a kidney stone, um, uh, which was a big one. And it was it was horrific. Um, so, you know, is it does this have any 
any bearing on other kind of disease? Or, or do you think, you know, somebody who's taken in a high amount of oxalates, they must be, they are in there and they are a thing. But do you think that they lodge in all the organs and whatever, like other people think they do, and that it takes years to get rid of them sometimes, and some people detox them more than others? Or do you think it's just another non-issue? What's what's your view on the whole oxalate craze? Mm -hmm. So... Um... So I think uh, those people who are uh, putting oxalate in their bodies are also putting other um, junk foods or shitty foods in their body. So it is very difficult to uh, tease this apart. It is easier to blame everything on the oxalate and not taking so many other stuff into uh, the equation. Uh, but the thing we can, we can simplify this uh, very easily. Stop eating those food items. Stop eating uh, a plant-based diet. Start eating a meat, fat-based diet, and then you will um, get rid of the ox any food that is containing oxalate because oxalate is coming from the plants. If you eat animal meat, fat organs, you will not get any oxalate from these food items. So there will be no input. Uh, no more oxalate input in your body, which would be uh, doing the harm to your body. Uh, and those ox the, the oxalate that, that was coming from a previous diet uh, will, 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 go, will go out because it, it, isn't, it doesn't get accumulated or it doesn't get stored um, wherever in your body. You have kidneys, and the kidneys uh, are trying to um, excrete the oxalate. And uh, if you stop eating food items that are containing oxalate, uh, you may be still urinating oxalate uh, for a few days or weeks, but then there will be no, no more oxalate, uh, I mean calcium oxalate in the urine. That's another thing, if you developed a kidney stone, uh, because of your uh, previous diet, during your previous diet. Uh, this is a build-up process. And uh, there may be a point where uh, you may your body uh, starts getting rid of these um, stones. But you can you can have kidney stones uh, at any point of your life. I, I mean you can you can start excreting peeing out kidney stones at any point if you in your life or on your healthy diet, if you had it before. So basically this also had nothing to do with, with actual oxalate consumption. And, 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 and this is the, the only uh, point where oxalate may be important, but you cannot do much about it. You know, if you had it because of your past diet, you can have kidney stones there is a risk that that a kidney stone will stuck in your ureter and and you will get pain you will get um, um, these attacks you need you may need an emergency uh, intervention if the if the um, if these stones has a certain size or you may just pass them out uh, whatever can happen, but you cannot do much about it. So you cannot have to, you shouldn't think too much about oxalate because it will not help solving your situation or your actual problem. But I don't think that any other problems may be caused because of your previous oxalate consumption. And, and don't forget that uh, there are many other problems. There are a myriad of problems <clears throat> associated with the plants, and oxalate is only one of them. And if I I have to name only one class of the toxins, then let it be the lectins, which is a huge family of uh, plant toxins uh, that cause intestinal permeability and uh, trigger a lot of autoimmune diseases. And, and these lectins there are more than 10,000 or 100,000 types of, of these uh, plant components which, uh, which plants produce in order to prevent themselves from being eaten. Or, um, so these, these are produced against uh, insects or any animal that would 
eat these plants. And altogether, these are much more dangerous than, than the oxalate. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how many there are. I mean, I, I love that video that Anthony did on it. You know, Anthony Chafee's plants are trying to kill you video. It's, I mean, I thought I knew about plant toxins, but he did a great job in that one. And it's amazing how many there are. I mean, I, I don't know if his professor is right, but um, when you think that it's a possibility that there's 136 known carcinogens in an organic Brussels sprout, it's like, this is not a health food. And you don't really see the 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 tribes eating stuff like that you know they'll eat the odd tuber and but they'll mainly eat meat and they'll eat a bit of seasonal fruit and berries but you know fruit berries nuts whatever and the odd tuber if the hunt fails but I don't see them really eating stalks and leaves you know none of them have a salad with their with their um you know water buffalo or whatever it is they've killed it doesn't happen and they know how toxic they are mm -hmm. um, and so it's yeah, unless they live in an environment uh, where there is a shortage of animal uh, based food um which is for example in in south america or in africa so yeah. if you mostly, they, right. they mostly then go for the tubers though don't they rather than sort of any sort of leaves or anything like that yeah and and, and that there is not many edible plants out there in the rainforest so your possibilities oh. are really limited no, it's funny that the vegans, they think that they could go into the rainforest and live on this abundance of fruit and whatever, and it just doesn't happen, does it? Yeah. <laughs> so um, one thing that, that I wanted to ask again, uh, something to, to do with that I forgot about the milk that people always ask, A2 versus A1, any difference really? Or is it just all the same sort of thing? You know, everybody goes, oh, well, if you can get goat's milk, that's much better than cow's milk and that sort of thing. Still no difference, just best avoided. Uh, yes, when it comes to the entirety of autoimmune diseases, I guess that there is not much difference. I think that such a difference has been established for, uh, for high heart disease, if I remember well, uh, but, uh, but, but not for the, the other diseases. So, and also clinical experience shows that whatever milk you are, ingesting whether it's a1 a2 goat cow whatever it, it it is not good for you yeah cool that's that one blown up now on um on a pkd diet after a while you say that um some people can reintroduce certain plant foods and you know i i mean i don't even miss them so i don't want to but a lot of people seem to sort of think that they they would need to do them and Honey and fruit seem to be the sort of things that are, are the, the least harmful. Well, not that honey is a plant food, but um, so what sort of things do you say that people can reintroduce and why and how long and, and, and you know, are there some things that would not have done us any harm if we'd have eaten them all our lives, but then we lose our privileges for, for them because we're broken from all the processed food and grains and you know beans and pulses and all of that mm -hmm. dairy and crap so are there some things that people could eat as plant foods that you reintroduce into that because that's something i've never looked at at that side of the pkd thing because i just have no desire to reintroduce any anyway because i never even liked them but you know what do you do with people like that when they're reintroducing plant foods mm -hmm. so so there are these pkd allowances that include certain vegetables fruits and honey uh, to, to a certain degree. And, and the same thing applies here as uh, the one for eating eggs or reintroducing eggs. Uh, wait until you reach your baseline in terms of your symptoms, in terms of your blood work result. And uh, if, if, you, if you do not have uh, cancer in the first place, which is uh, where, where the time factor is very important and you shouldn't play around, uh then you may give a try and reintroduce uh, one thing at a time and look at your symptoms and uh, also look at your blood work so the more thing you reintroduce uh the more blood works you need to do to 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 remain on the safe side and this is just for uh their um uh, this is just this is just for their taste, or this is just how they feel about eating something outside of the PKD. Because 
there are certain patients who say that uh, I, I cannot do this in this form anymore. No, no, no more days. <laughs> I, 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 I die for uh, eating an apple or whatever. And, and then there are two possibilities. Either it is a possibility because the patient already gained time, doesn't have a very serious disease, and then can give a try and see how this affects. And there are other patients who are not in a position of uh, allowing uh, something like this. But in any case, it is always a patient's decision. Generally, it, it is better to eat an apple rather than drinking a glass of wine or milk or yogurt. <laughs> Do you think do you think there's any benefit whatsoever to plant foods? No, I'm sure there's <laughs> no benefit whatsoever. Nice. I'm so, glad we well, that. there is no health argument. There is no health argument behind allowing uh, plant uh, food items that there is there is only, only you know psychological arguments. Yeah, absolutely. Or social arguments. That's a weird one for me because I, I've never had that. You know, I, I I always like to be the one who's sitting there going, I'll just have a steak. And then everybody else has got pizza and ice cream and chips and all that sort of thing. And then they look at you and they say, but you you might get cancer or heart disease. <laughs> and, and you're like, and, and you you find that you're the only one who can fit on the chair in the restaurant, you know, and they're all worried about you because you're not drinking Coca-Cola, you know. Very, very strange. It really is. But um one another thing I wanted to really ask you about is fasting, because you say that um, you don't really agree with it. And I, I would say that, you know, in the time when I didn't know what to eat, it was incredibly useful. It did make me waste away. I did lots of fasting. I did sort of it was all water fasting back then. And, and I did. I think my longest was 11 days. But because of the crap I was eating, mm -hmm. it was heaven because all the symptoms went away. But but, you know, obviously you're not nourishing yourself in the meantime. And I've, I've heard you said to me that the, the problem is that, you know, you're not getting the nutrients in that the body needs to, to, to restore itself. But is there ever a case? I mean, when somebody says to me, you know, when somebody says, well, a meat diet's obviously lunatic and it doesn't matter what you eat. I, I, I will sometimes say, well, look, if you're that closed up to the fact and your doctor's told you that diet doesn't matter at all. Just don't eat for a couple of days. You tell me if those symptoms come down and then the symptoms come down and then they go, oh, actually, maybe I'm listening to you now. Maybe what is it in my diet that's hurting me and what isn't? So it can be sort of a, a persuasion thing <laughs> for people. But do you think there's ever any any um, uh, point to it? Because dry fasting particularly kind of fascinates me with the, the research that the Russians have done into it, Phil and Ov and whatever, where they two independent Russian researchers came up with this sort of 11 day dry fast protocol that they say blows up every disease. You get rid of cancer with a, an acidotic crisis on the eighth and 10th days, all that autophagy going on, ketosis, all that kind of thing, body producing mm -hmm. its, its deuterium depleted cellular water and getting rid of all the cysts and whatever. What, what, what do you think? Is there any, any excuse for fasting or if you're fully PKD that takes care of everything? anyway right yes <laughs> uh, that, that that's how it is so if you do not have a better idea then you fast if you do not know any other diet than the western type diet then do fast so again uh, it is a matter of uh, what do you compare it with uh, if you're coming from a western diet and you start a fast uh, you will obviously uh, lose weight, you will improve your blood sugar, you will improve blood, uh, blood pressure, and, and there, there will be many other benefits. But this is because uh, you are not eating anymore those um, <clears throat> food items that gave you these symptoms. So this is by excluding the bad thing out of your previous diet. But as you know, fasting is not um, sustainable after a certain point. Because you will, it, it is just um, uh, an analogy is that there has been attempts uh, for sleep deprivation to cure depression or many other diseases. And it worked for one day, but you cannot sustain um, 
um, sleep loss for more than a few days because you will die. If you do not eat, you will die. At least you have to eat. No, no, food, no. Even no. if it is uh, a junk food. No, it's fair. You're, you're, no, you energy. You're, but otherwise, you, you, you will die. You have to do something instead. And if you go back to eating your bad diet, your Western type diet, you didn't solve anything. Yeah. Exactly. If you want a real solution, so fasting may be a, a few days solution for the part of your problems, but not a final solution for a serious problem. No, and for, see, for those who are, who are otherwise doing a, a healthy diet and they um, start fasting, they will not get any benefit they only will get the negatives because they will not get the benefit of the healthy diet. And this is further depleting their, their nutrient stores. So for example, if you're anemic and stop eating the red meat, your anemia will worsen and your inflammation will go up. I have, I have seen many fasting blood works and honestly, they, they do not look good. That's interesting. Yes. You see, the thing is, I had a fruitarian on my podcast recently, and as he was telling me, humans are naturally frugivores, and um, he's going through fruitarianism, heading towards breatharianism. Isn't it amazing how people think that they can do this? Honestly, it's a real craze at the moment. All you need is fruit, because that's the natural human diet, and then you end up just being able to live on fresh air and prana. <laughs> These people, I've never seen one succeed. I mean, maybe some yogi in the Himalayas has done it at some point, but it's it's amazing how it's getting into people's heads and they're listening to these sort of, you know, fruitarian gurus. It's really very, very strange. It's, it's almost some kind of a, a mental illness, I believe, you know, that they actually believe that they're going to one day survive on just fresh air. I mean, why would you want to? Steak's great, right? <laughs> Don't understand. <laughs> No, such things are not sustainable. You should have an, uh, a next uh, conversation with the same person in a year, in two years, and then exactly. speak about their experience. Exactly. exactly. Now, now it is enthusiasm or their psychological beliefs uh, speaking instead of um, biology speaking. <laughs> but <laughs> very easy. So everybody can say what they want. Uh, if they are convinced enough of their truth, but uh, you can always look at the blood work and the blood work is objective or any other parameter is objective parameter. And you can you can compare two objective parameters in an objective way. And that, that will tell you the, the real situation. If you are eating fruits, you will never get folate, vitamin B12, vitamin D and, and many other nutrients which we know are essential. And they also know that it is essential because they are into supplementing vitamin D. I've never seen any vegetarian not supplementing on vitamin B12. Yeah, there is that. You see, what they say is that, um, you know, you don't need any of that stuff once you get to the correct state of consciousness and you get enough bio photons in from your, your, your fruit. Anyway, let's not waste time on fruit terrorism. It's barking mad. You know, and, uh, I I look back to when I was a kid. This is one of our another question from one of our, our members, and and I I had I was okay, except that I did have you know had some migraines sometimes. These even as a kid, I had um, uh, um, some asthma once once in a while but but i'd also get a load of hay fever which i don't get anymore at all now i, I don't eat plants and do you think that that these sort of things building up in kids like hay fever and stuff and these seasonal allergies are are a bit of a a warning sign of 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 sort of developing autoimmunity maybe yes it is it is it is one of the earliest sign of uh, developing autoimmunity in the background and these symptoms uh, come hand in hand later on so allergy uh, or eczema are the very first ones in children and then hay fever or asthma uh, in around uh, the age of between 5 and 15 and 
And then the other will come like type 1 diabetes, which is a childhood onset autoimmune disease or Crohn's disease. And, and or if you, if you ask any children or parents of such child who have been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, it's very often said that the child also had allergy at the age of two, three, four, or also had hay fever or allergy because these are building up. And there is always a new autoimmune component on the top of the previous one. And this is, of course, very closely linked to their diet. And um, if you ask one food item, then this is the milk protein again, <clears throat> which is behind uh, the chain of these autoimmune conditions. So even if you do not do anything as just removing the milk component from their diet, hay fever improves or completely uh, goes away or allergy, eczema, all these may go away just by excluding any milk and any dairy. Not the same with type 1 diabetes or Crohn's disease because it is more developed. It comes later, uh, but these uh, simple autoimmune diseases may be reversed by eliminating the milk from the diet. And, and the children's diet is very milk heavy nowadays. It wasn't that uh, it wasn't that way when we were children or before we were children. Yeah, I I um I used to notice even when I was vegetarian that if if I gave up dairy early in the year and remembered to stick to it, my hay fever was greatly reduced. Mm -hmm. it didn't yes. really go and to, but I mean I had it so bad it was you know I'd be inside with the windows shut and bowls mm -hmm. of cold water and it, it was horrific and now I have to look at other people sneezing to know that it's hay fever season it's it I get amazed that it took me so long to work it out you know yes. and yes. of course the doctors don't know um yes and, and the vegetarian think of meat as not harming an animal but still replacing animal protein so that's why they turn uh, towards eating milk yeah. and dairy and cheese but this is again a suboptimal solution because it's creating another problem yeah exactly yeah. now i have uh I, I i live very close to a, a tm community the meditation community which i moved up here thinking i was just going to be a yogi you know in 1986 and i moved up here and um the community was great at the time it was fun everybody was young everybody was okay but now they're in their sort of 60s and 70s and the rates of cancer and autoimmunity mm -hmm. eating these sort of lacto ovo vegetarian diets the sort of southern indian thing and loads of pulses which are full of lectins and you know rice and dal and that kind of thing and my friends you know so many of them have dropped you know i remember losing two on the same day to cancer one to pancreatic cancer one to brain cancer um, uh, on the same day uh, a, a few years ago and this is going on and on I did a video on my channel of what you know diet brainwashing why spiritual people still die of cancer and it's funny mm -hmm. how how so much they get caught up in this and so many things in the world are, 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 are sort of turning us away from meat and sooner or later if we let it carry on we're going to be we're going to be eating beyond burgers and cricket flour you know, I mean, the, the indigestible chitin and whatever in insects, and they're trying to turn us to those now. It's uh, just insane what's happening. So we, we've got to keep fighting in the trenches. Now, Ben had a um, question. Just a couple more, I think, for, for you, but and then I'll let you go because I just realized sometime I've got to get you back again. I've got a million things I could ask you. <laughs> but Ben says, we agree that with, with your fear that food is the most important and simplest broad strokes fix for health. But what are, what other hacks does she include or recommend, such as light, stress, emotions, sleep, et cetera? Are you looking at things like um, uh, sorting people's light environment out where they're ruining their circadian biology with these sort of horrible LED down lighters, things like that? Are you, do, you, do you take into that into consideration EMFs, household toxins, things like that? What, how, how much does this okay. play a part? As you know, I am a big proponent of uh, simplifying uh, rather than um, uh, making things up and um, more complicated than necessary. So I, I don't, I personally, I don't really believe in this light stuff or anything that is around <laughs> red light or or, or anything. It, uh, 
you know, we, we never suggest such things and uh, the diet alone approach works. So, and I, I also do not like to um, combine scientific stuff with uh, things I do not believe to be scientific. And there are so many strange or fringe ideas uh, being thrown around. And, and why should we mix and match everything that we come across? I understand that there are a lot of proponents behind uh, red light or use screens with uh, different filters and, and things like this. But, but this, is, this is just at a theoretical level. In my opinion, it is just a theoretical level and, and things just work completely fine. Instead of concentrating something that, that is not needed, not necessary, concentrate on doing the diet properly. This is my, my advice to, <clears throat> to the patient. They always say to me, okay, I have this little symptom. Can I use red light um, to, to fix this? <laughs> and, and this is not a good approach because you, you, need, you, make, you need to make sure that you're doing the diet properly. Otherwise, the red light will not help you. And you just lose time by trying out these ideas, which, which have no scientific, scientific basis behind. And also, I also know that there is this magnetism thing or electricity, uh, electric smog or things like that. I, I, I've never seen any evidence, uh, any real or any convincing evidence that removing electricity would heal or would help or would help your sleep. If, if your sleep is broken, then there should be something in your brain or there should be something wrong in your diet. You need to find out again, rather than covering it or escaping into another myth. So to me, this is, this is kind of a, this spiritual thing that you, that you hinted at. I mean, spirituality, um, otherwise, may be a good thing and necessary to human existence. But when it comes to disease, just, just look at the disease as uh, a manifestation of your biology, your, your genes, your hormones, your, your nutrients, your intestinal permeability, and, and, and you will have the solution. You, you, know, you do not need to step outside the biology to, to fix your uh, physical physical issues but if you if you enjoy if you feel that it it gives you a relief then then do it because I do I, I do not advise against anything that is harmless or at least neutral <laughs> if you like it do it just do not do anything that interferes with your diet well you know I I, I do agree with you a lot on that but I, I think from my own experience and from other people's experience that you know, particularly the light, getting enough sun, getting the light in your eyes in the morning, getting that circadian biology thing, it can it it can it can really help. It can really help sleep. It can help emotions. I mean, look at the amount of how they how they get battery chickens to lay eggs. You know, they leave. Yeah, but I would call this uh, timing of your sleep, your sleep window, your sleep. This yeah, yeah, has sure. nothing to do with. Of course, this is associated with the light, but but then fix your sleep timing. Uh, if they ask me about sleep, I, 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 I very often uh, deal with this issue because this is important. So you, you, you need to, um, so in order to um, enjoy um, best energy level throughout the day, you need to have a certain timing of your sleep. Uh, you shouldn't go uh, to bed beyond a certain time. You shouldn't wake up <clears throat> later than a certain time. So this is fixing your circadian rhythm, mm. uh, which is helpful to your energy, well-being, circadian, circadian rhythms. I, I completely agree with this, but this is also tied in our biology. Nothing spiritual and nothing crazy stuff. This is just... No, absolutely, yeah. No, what pure you saying, biology. But... And well, if they are doing to... this red light because of replacing uh, sun, or I, I do not know them, this may help to fix the uh, the circadian rhythm. But why do not you fix yeah, the no, circadian I do, I, rhythm I, itself I mean, without the, the red light? 
Yeah, yeah. For, for me, it's not about like sort of finding a red light that will heal anything. I, I'm I'm suspicious of that. My thing more is just that we turn the lights off at night and just have red lights. And it just it's almost like having a sunset. And that's great. It even feels nicer. And even in that case, yeah, it feels cool. nicer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, the, the thing I will totally agree on is that once you're sick, if somebody carries on eating what they're eating and starts to mess about with red lights, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Right. I will totally agree with you on that one, because the, the biggest thing is to take out the crap from what you're eating. Once the gut's leaky, whatever your opinion is of what's caused the gut to be leaky, whether it's, you know, horrific emotions, childhood trauma, pizza or whatever it is. Once mm -hmm. it's leaky, really, there is without a doubt, nothing, nothing quicker than going to a, a PKD diet. Absolutely. And so if somebody isn't doing that, faffing around with the light is not going to really do very much at all um so i totally agree with you on that one however small the component might be in the end but it's just kind of nice to get back to that sort of ancestral timing and light and it's funny when i go into somebody's house now and they have those sort of led down lighters at night or if i have to play a gig at night in a place like that i'm like that's weird you know it just feels all wrong now they've changed all the light horribly but anyway sophia i think that's um you know um as much time as probably I can take up of yours and and just thank you so much and you know I've heard you talking about the battles that you're having with um you know the mainstream monsters in in in, in medicine and it's such a shame because I mean you're doing proper work out there you're doing amazing stuff for people and thank you you know to, it, it is it is an endless uh, fight indeed so yeah very very clever and uh ready to fight uh, the fight yeah absolutely the, actually nobody else will do it uh, for you yeah and um, sometimes it's better not to fight uh, just to do your own job uh, in a separated way and uh, avoid conflict because it is also conflict um, not, not always helpful yeah so I mean, in in the early days with me, when I started to fix it and I started to feel loads better and I then an appointment with the rheumatologist came up, you know, and I haven't seen one for 10 years, you know, but I thought, oh, I'll go back and I'll show him how well I'm doing. And I got to the waiting room and I was jumping around. I was fine. And all his patients were really sick and on walking sticks and bandaged up and eating biscuits out of their handbags, you know, and this is a hospital of rheumatology. And the first thing you smell when you go in is toast, because that's what they're doing at the cafe for people. You know, it's amazing. And I went in there under the jet, under the misapprehension that he was going to be amazed and really pleased. How did you do that? I would have thought that they would really want to know how somebody did something like that. But no, he actually got really angry with me that I wouldn't take mm -hmm. his um, methotrexate. It was incredible. And and there's just no it's, it, it, there's an old saying, isn't there, that, you know, you can't convince somebody of something whose livelihood depends on not being convinced of it. So the battles with the medical system there, I, I just, I, I, I wish you all the best and that the bastards leave you alone and, and let you get on with some proper work there and stop hassling you because, I mean, you're, you're a big hero of mine as well as a good friend. And honestly, so many people speak so, so highly of you. People are always asking me, what, what, what would Sophia say about this? What would she say about that? You know? <laughs> And so, you know, it's getting out thank there. You. So, so just brilliant. Well done. And thank you for all your wisdom and your friendship. And thank you so much for coming on. The thank podcast. you, Phil. Uh, I was enjoying as, <laughs> you, as usually. Oh, cool. Well, I hope to see you soon. Bye bye. bye. See you later. Bye bye. Call us all.